So the, 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 the project in question that we tend to actually discuss, it's a, we say it's a, what do you call it? Cartoon. Cartoon. Cartoon monitoring using tracker. And yeah. Cartoon monitoring using GSM GPS tracking device. Or tracking system. So this is what the project is supposed to do. So in in in, in short form, we are saying that we want to design a system that can be attached to the body of cattle. A ca a cattle a, a, in, in this example, in this instance, a, a cattle, such that we can actually know, I mean, we can actually have it in the body of the cattle and leave the cattle to wander. And at any point in time, we, we want to be able to remotely know the location of that cattle on the map. And then we then we want to take certain actions. Now, so if you look at it, the focus is to be able to tell location in real time. What do we able to tell the location of that asset in real time? In addition to tracking location, we also want to be able to set virtual things, virtual boundary. We want to be able to set virtual boundary. In setting virtual boundary is what I mean we term geofencing. Are we? Geofencing. We want to be able to actually set boundaries virtually. We here we say oh if as long as these cattles are within this parameter, do nothing. But once they leave this fence or this geofence or this virtual fence, then you can let me know. Via text message. Now, so this, this, these are the very two uh, uh, features or two purposes or two uh, vital uh, operations that the system is supposed to carry out. We want to be able to tell the location in real time where those cattle are. We also want to be able to set virtual boundaries and we want to know when they have exceeded that virtual boundary. So, first to set, the other, the other thing is to know when uh, uh, the boundaries has been breached when you breach the boundary we want to know is, 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 are, are, we, are we on track? Yes, so this is exactly what we want to do now to achieve this we are going to need certain components or certain materials sensors and transducers to achieve this now we don't even know what we want to use to achieve this yet but our block diagram will be able to explain or give us an hint into all of the components that we are likely going to need to achieve this. What will that block diagram look like? We're going to look those. First is that we're going to have a power supply secretary or a power supply unit. All of these are just block. In the block are constituent diagrams consisting of different components. Which we are going to discuss as we continue. But first, is we are supposed to have a power supply block. Don't forget, power supply is integral to the survival of any electronic system. You need power supply, whether from a battery, from a generating set, a generator, or from Nepal, from PC, from anywhere, or from even an inverter. Now, the very next very critical thing we're going to need is going to be our microcontroller. Now, feel free, if you have any questions as well, just let me know so we can talk about it. Will be the mouse controller. To the mouse controller, we are going to need, first of all, we are going to need a GPS module. Since our system has to do with what? Location tracking. The only component in the market that can help us with location tracking will be what? A GPS. A GPS module. Only a GPS helps us with what? Location tracking. Other than the GPS module, uh, we're going to also need a GSM module. Also connecting to the mouse controller. The GPS module is to help us with location tracking. It was supposed to help us with some coordinates, latitude, longitude, um, number of satellites that is seen, uh, speed, 
course, height above sea level, and other parameters that it should deliver to us. That was that stupidest thing to give to us. It also give us day time and rest. The GSM module, from the word GSM, Global System for what? What was the full meaning of GSM? Global Computing System. GSM. GSM. <laughs> what <is> GSM? <laughs> Global, global system for mobile communication. Mobile communication. GPS in other words. Global wow. positioning system. Are you? So, there are two things an average or a typical GSM module does for you. It makes score, it receives score, it sends text messages and receives text messages. Mm-hmm. Other than all of the other paparazzi that is one around the mobile phone these days. So, if it's supposed to be a cattle monitoring system. If we have a GPS already attached to the cattle, and the cattle is wandering, and we don't want to have to be present, we don't have to be physically present all the time with the cattle, it means we will need a way where we can sit down in our own convenience and ask the system, where is the cattle right now? Something needs to actually trigger the GPS to get the coordinates. And when the coordinates is gotten, it needs to be sent to us via emails. The simplest means in doing that, or to assume that would be to have a GSM model, is it's like me asking for where you are. I send you a text message, where are you, please? And then you say, oh, I'm at Bariga. Does it make sense? I'm at Upstep Engineering. You get it now? All right. So the essence of the GSM model would be, I mean, this is going to be with which we query the system to get coordinates. And then when the coordinates are gotten, they are sent back to us, and then we receive it. Does it make sense? So that's the essence of what of GPS can do. Another thing that this system is going to actually require, we're going to need indicators. I don't know how many indicators we're going to need, but we're going to need indicators. I don't think we're going to need an alarm. We don't need it. Since we are not going to be where the animals are going to be, where the cattle are going to be, we don't need that alarm. I mean, so if you look at it basically, this is what your blood level should look like. You're supposed to have a power supply that feeds an indicator, feeds the mouth controller, that feeds the GSM module and feeds the GPS module. So this is what your block diagram should look like. Can I continue, sir? Mm-hmm. So this is your block diagram. If you have your mobile phone, then snap this because we're going to clean this up. So this is what your block diagram. <laughs> Don't forget, the system is to track cattle. In tracking cattle, in track, it should be able to get coordinates and then send those coordinates to us. Does it make sense? Mm-hmm. All right. Let's now begin to actually break these blocks into their constituent diagram and then see where that, that takes us and where that leads us. But don't forget the essence of the project. The essence is to be able to tell location in real time. The other uh, 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 feature is that we should be able to actually set visual boundaries. And then we also want to know when that visual boundaries has been exceeded by those animals. We want to know. So, three main things we should be able to do. Are you there? Although, there are other things that we should be able to do. You don't forget that part of what the system should also be able to do is to allow us query the system to ask for location. Which means we should be able to query the system for real time location. Via SMS. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Why don't you let me silence this? You don't let me vibrate it. Thank you. So we should be able to ask for what? We should be able to query the system. Let me let me have that one. As part of functionality, we should be able to query the system for its current location don't forget that mm-hmm. should be able to do that and we do that via what via sms i mean we also should be able to set visual boundary i mean mm-hmm. we should also be able to what set boundary or geofence be able to set geofence this one too via sms mm-hmm. 
We should also be able to set in setting that geo fence. We set the geo fence, and then we set the geo fence and set the distance too. Because of course, the geo fence we are setting is the distance from a current location to mm -hmm. any other location outside that perimeter. Mm -hmm. So that's what the geo fence is. Another thing that we should be able to do is we should also be able to set administrator's phone number. Don't forget, somebody will be the one that will receive the phone number. Mm -hmm. Now, let me tell you the beauty of the system. And I mean, this is where the importance of what I want to explain this is. If you have an asset that, I mean, say for instance, this kind of a system, and maybe somebody knows that you own those cattle, and that if the cattle stray, you are going to get a text message. Mm -hmm. And the person from whatever reason first came and attacked, your mobile phone, collected your mobile phone from you before you went after the cattle. If it goes after the cattle, you will not be able to receive text messages anymore because the phone will switch or the number will switch you receive the SMS has not been taken from you. Do you understand this? But because of that, that's why we designed the system so that you can pick up any other person's phone. You can pick up any other person's phone around and make that person the administrative, the, an administrator or make him a valid recipient of that message. The moment you make that person's number the valid recipient for the message, the system will no longer be sending the SMSs to your line anymore. It's going to send it to this particular phone where you, that, I mean, that you are presently with you. So that at the end of the day, your, the, the information you need to receive can still be received. Do you understand it? Yes, sir. Do you understand <coughs> this part I just explained? Mm -hmm. If we had coded it, if we coded with the program system so that we told the system, only this particular phone number is what you should send the message to. The moment that phone is taken from you or the SIM is taken from you, the system cannot, it means like your phone off. Your SIM, if your phone is off, your SIM card is out of your phone. Mm -hmm. Wherever, irrespective of the number of text messages that is sent to you, you aren't going to receive them. Does it make sense? But if you can pick up another phone, any other person's phone with, a, with his own SIM, and you can, tell, you can write the system, since you know the phone of the SIM, number in the in the module and say you know what don't write that my number again start writing me right now you're going to get the same information do you get do you get it mm -hmm. so that's how the system is sent so as part of the future or part of this operation the system should be able to carry out it should allow you to at at any time be able to change the recipient phone number to whatever phone number you have set it to do you get it so that if you are receiving information on your phone and you realize your phone is dead you can pick up your friend's phone and set your phone, your friend's phone number as a valid recipient. If you are traveling away, or say if you are traveling and your and your phone, your friend says, oh, "I need my phone," and he picks up his phone, you can pick up any other person's phone again and write the system such that you now become what the valid recipient of the text message. That way, irrespective of the phone or the phone number you are holding, you can always continue to get those text messages as I mean as you want. Does that make sense? So you should be able to actually set. I dash you. Yeah. You should be able to set recipient recipient phone number at any given point in time. Does it doesn't make sense? Uh, the other thing you should also be able to you can you can query for current location, you can set geofence, you can set recipient phone number. Are you? Mm -hmm. you Alongside with being able to tell location in real time, set measure boundary, and know when the boundary has been exceeded. Now, when the boundary is exceeded, you receive a text message. So that's part of what the system is supposed to do. So when the boundary is ex exceeded, you receive what? An SMS that tells you, oh, the cars are now exceeded this particular boundary, and this is the location they are currently at. Are you with me, sir? Yes. And with that information, if you click on the link that is sent to you, and it takes and you have an internet in your phone is internet enabled. If you go you take it straight to Google Map and on Google Map you can actually tell where those animals or the cattle or the asset is at the moment in real time. Does it make sense? Yeah. So this is basically what the system is supposed to do alongside this so If you want to you to snap this to update this information, it's very very important. Why are you not writing? Sir? Why are you not writing? Okay. I, I do okay, since we have the video, get the video. Okay. Well, you should always snap those things to me. The brain that will clean them and does not show clearly. Can we continue? Yes. All right. So, when we pass supply block, 
what should your power supply look like? Now, one thing that we know that we have already explained here is that in designing or in deciding what our power supply should look like, our power supply should be should be mobile. This system will be strapped on a cattle, or this system will be strapped on a cattle. If it's strapped on a cattle in the bush, there might not be electric, elect, uh, electricity in, in, in the bush or in the farm where there might be. Even if you have a generating set there, you can't just tie wire to the generating set and tie a long wire to the system or connect the wire to the system so as it goes, it goes with the wire. Trust me, they are going to bite on the wire and if they bite on the wire, it might electric, even if they should go to them. So which means the system is supposed to carry a mobile battery. And if it's going to be a mobile battery, it has to be a battery. So it means that in the discussion or in deciding what the power supply should be, we know that our primary power supply has to come from what? From a battery cell. Mm -hmm. So you're supposed to have, if this is your power supply, you're supposed to have a battery. A battery that has the positive terminal and that has the negative terminal. So first of all, it's a battery you're going to use. Now, of course, it should be a rechargeable battery. It should be a rechargeable battery. It should be a battery that maybe at, int at interval, maybe every week, you can come around and just change the battery. Are you with me, sir? Mm -hmm. Change the battery and then replace replace with the fully charged one and go with it. I mean, with the already depleted one and then charge that so every week you can come in. Does it, does it, make, does it make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at it, the system does not actually uh, take out uh, manpower. You still, I mean, we still need a man's intervention, a man's uh, involvement. Even if it has to do with just coming to change your fully charged battery with an, with an already depleted, uh, depleted battery. So your power supply will begin with a battery. In the battery, can I continue? Yes, sir. Don't forget. Through a switch. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. A power switch. Through a power switch. And then you're going to have a capacitor that filters the line. Before the voltage goes into the voltage regulator. Now, in, the, in deciding what your power supply will look like, I hope you don't mind all of this explanation. Mm -hmm. In deciding what your power supply will look like, you have to know what the power requirement for all of the other modules. On the you need to know. Mm -hmm. Let me give you an instance. Your indicator is going to run on 5 volts from your mantle controller. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Your GSM module will work with between 3.4 to 4.3 volts. Mm -hmm. <coughs> between 3.4 to 4.3 volts. And it's going to require this voltage at a minimum of 1.5 amps. If not two amps, some manufacturer will tell you it's two amps. The GPS module will work with five volts DC too. The mark controller will also work with five volts DC. So if you look at it, your power supply should be such that can produce five volts, five volts, five volts, and what? Between 3.4 to 4.3 volts. And it should be able to actually supply that at at least two amps. Are you getting it? We had actually decided to use a lithium battery for the project. We use three lithium battery, have we? Yeah. Each at 4.2, 4.2, 4.2, 4.2, the other one at 3.9. 3.9. 3.9. 3.9. 3.9. 3.9. 3.9. 3.9. 3.9. 3.9. 3.9. 3.9. 3.9. 3.9. 3.9. 3.9. 3.9. 3.9. 3.9. 3.
a voting regulator. Are you with me, sir? Yes. We're going to need to bring in what? So this is called a voltage regulator. Now, there are different types of voting regulators in the market. Mainly, we have two types, the variable voting regulators and the fixed voting regulators, or the fixed value voting regulators. For the fixed uh, 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 value voting regulators, they are positive fixed voting regulators and negative fixed voting regulators. But because we are not working with negative voltages here, we are working with only positive voltages here, we will just restrict our class to only the things that we are using. Does it make sense? So the voltage regulator that we have chosen to use is one that is called the 7805. The 78 here implies that it's a positive voltage regulator. The 05 represents its output voltage. The voltage regulator is going to have three tags. We are going to have the input, which is here. We are going to have the common. And then you are going to have the house, which is your output. So when 12.1 volt goes in, what comes out? 5 volts. Does it make sense? Only 5 volts comes out. Can we continue? Now, so as that, if you have another capacitor featuring this output, this place is where your plus 5 volts DC, the source line. So any component or any device or any track on the board that requires 5 volts, please look up, get the 5 volts from this point. Mm. Does it make sense? Yes. So the 5 volts is sourced from this point. Now, but you see this voltage regulator, hmm? we'll only supply this 5 volts to you at 1 hand maximum. At what, sir? 1 hand maximum. Now, but don't forget that even if you supply it at one half, your indicator is not going to have a problem with that five volts at one half. Your bank contract might not also have a problem with it at one half. Your G GPS module might not have a problem with it, but your GSM module will have a problem with it. Because your GSM module does not require what? Five volts. It requires between what? 3.4 to 4.3 volts. That's the first thing you need to notice. Secondly, it requires that voltage at two halves. So if you stay with this voltage regulator alone, this voltage regulator cannot power the GSM module for the voltage requirement, neither can it supply it the current requirement. Do you understand what I just said? Do you understand this? The GSM module requires between 3.4 to 4.3. This guy is supplying 5 volts. It's enough to damage it. Now, the voltage regulator you have here can only supply 1 amp. This GSM module requires the current at around 2 amps. So you have to do something. So it means somehow, somehow, you need to look for a way to drop this five volts to between 3.4 to 4.4 volts. What do we do? You can bring in a diode here, a rectifying diode. For most voltage regulators, like everyone already knows, voltage regulator will not supply you five volts. A five volt regulator will not supply you five volts. It will apparently supply you between maybe 4.7 down to 4.9 are you with me? now if you place a diode in series to this voltage line because this diode we are going to use is going to be the one that is made of silicon silicon is going to lose 0 0.6 from, where, from whatever signal that is coming in now if it was 4.9 you took out 0 0.6 what do you have left? 4.3 volts does it make sense? Does it make sense? And if it's 4.3, that 4.3 is already within the range of what? The voltage requirement for the what? For the GSM model. But don't forget, even this diode that you're using here is your 1N4007. The 1N4007 itself. Uh, so, like I said, the 1N4007 will drop 0 0.6 from wherever it's coming in to it. But even it too, we only allow a current of only one amp to flow through. Only a current of what? One amp. More so, the voltage that is here too, that is flowing from the voltage regulator, will also only be coming out at what? One amp. So we need another device, which we can actually use to create like a current amplifier. So from the output of this, we're going to send this to the base of the transistor. To the base of the transistor. The transistor we have chosen to use 
is going to be your TIP 41C. I name of the transistor. What the transistor simply does, of course, when will they begin to actually, okay, maybe here we can talk on power amplifier, the current amplifier. What the transistor actually simply does <coughs> is to help you amplify whatever amount of current that is coming here. I get my point now. To whatever current it can actually amplify it. But don't forget, whatever current is actually going to amplify it will be whatever current that is readily available, available to be delivered by this your, mm -hmm. uh, your battery. So the collector of this transistor will come and join itself here, which is the input of the battery. So all of the current that is available on the battery can flow through it. And from here, you can now have a capacitor that filters this place to your ground, and then the GSM module can have its own voltage source in it. So from here, you know that what is going to lie here will lie between 3.4 to 4.4 volts at a higher current, at the current rate that was the one hand that you Does that make sense? That is the circuit diagram for the power supply. So the GSM module gets its own power from here. Why every other module gets the power supply from the fiber that are here? I think we should stop it here. Mm -hmm. I just ask questions and we'll stop it here. A capacitor, as you see, is your 1000 microfarad 25 volts, and this one is your 100 microfarad 16 volts. Is that, this is, these two are electrolytic capacitors. This is a diode. This is a transistor. Actually, it's an MPN transistor. Now, this is a voltage regulator. This guy is your power switch. This is a switch. This is a battery. This is a voltage regulator. This is a diode, this is a transistor. When we eventually finish with this explanation, I will have to show you all of these components on board. Because they actually, they actually exist on that circuit board. Do you understand this? Yes. Let's quickly begin from here. The block. For the power supply, I mean, we are the manual controller, I we are the GSM, we are the GPS module, all connected to the controller, I mean, please follow the button. We are the GSM, we are the GPS module, I mean, uh -huh. uh, what did we have here? Nothing. That's all we have. That's all we have. Is there another thing there? No, power supply, mm -hmm. that's all we have. And then we said, now, uh, power supply, I mean, of course, we discuss, we're not supposed to be a battery, a battery power system or supply from which we now have voltage that was powered the GSM. We said the GSM will require between 3.4 to 4.3 volts at 2 amps. We said the GPS module does require just 5 volts. I mean, yes. nah. of course, we mentioned, don't say, don't say that, so you mean you're actually not following. We had indicators, we didn't have that way. In the block, we had indicators. No, I don't see just one No, no, we had indicators. And then we said the indicator fed for the GPS for the adjustment. I think this is this was, this was all. Are we? The indicator was also we missed out. Mm -hmm. Alright, so I will discuss the, the, the power supply. Uh, the GPS will be something I've discussed with you before. Please, uh, close that. Uh, close that box. We said the GPS module that we tend to use is our Neon 6M. And from indication, from what I discovered, I said the Neon 6M will need to have four pins out. Actually, it has five pins uh, for the Neon 7M that we bought. It has a pin called the PPS. I said we don't need it, we will not use it. 
the main, the, the most important pins here are your VCC pin. This is where your plus five volt is connected to. Are we? You say you have the the ground pin or your VSS pin, isn't it? Where the ground pin is. Then you have the TXD and then you have the RXD. The TXD and the RXD. So in connecting this with your mile controller, if this was your mile controller, if this was your controller, what you are going to do is this TXD was going to go to the RX of the mouse controller. Why is one area to go to the TX yes. of the mouse controller? And I told you the reason for that. When I speak, it's to your ear. So transmit you receive. When you speak with your mouth, it is to my own ear. Does it make sense? So his own mouth to his own ear, his own mouth to his own ear. Does it make sense? So the this is the this is the GPS module. So his own transmit line goes to the receive line of the mouse controller. Why the mouse controller transmit line goes into the receive of the GPS module? Now, the way the GPS module is designed, the moment you give it voltage, which is power, uh, this is it, you give it voltage here, uh, positive voltage, you give it negative voltage, it just continues, it will wait until it connects to the, uh, to the, to the satellite. Please, are you here, sir? Yes. Once it connects to the satellite, it just continues to transmit the satellite information like that, connect to transmit it. So, for that reason, we many times don't make use of his receive line. Do you understand it? We don't make use of this is line, so we don't connect it. We don't use it. We only need this channel because it's like a, it's like a running tap. As long as it's open, what happens? Well, as long as there's water in the reservoir, the tank just keep giving up. Uh, uh, it's it's, uh, it's constant. Do you understand it? Man? So once it connects to the satellite, it just continues to transmit. So all you need to do. It will keep receiving what is transmitting, and then it is from there you know, and then makes sense. Of it. But don't forget what it is transmitting is doing to the mouse controller. Mm -hmm. It is within the environment of the controller, the program that you receive it. Then you say, oh, this one is for this, this is for this, this is for this, for the latitude, this is for longitude, this is for uh, uh, course, this is for altitude, this is for number of satellites, and all of these others and information that you need. Do you understand it? So that's all you should know about GPS. So long as you give it voltage, it connects to the satellite, it just continues to download the content of the satellite and then transmit it through this line. All you need to do is to roll source, keep receiving it and then make a sense of it. For the GSM module, that's on the GPS. For the GSM module, GSM the GSM you are actually using is the one that is called the SIM 800 m Because it's 800L. This module 2 has four pins that will make you that. You have the VCC, where you input between your uh, 3.4 to 4.3 volts. It has the VSS, which is the one you take to the zero uh, or negative of your brand, uh, negative of your supply. Then it has its TXD and its RXD pin too. And you already know what, what this is for. This is what it transmits to the mouse controller, and this is what it receives from the mouse controller. Does it make sense? So what happens is this. If this was your controller too, just like we did before, this transmit goes to the receive, and then this receive goes to the transmit. Does it make sense? So what happens is this. Say for instance, you want to query the system. You want the, the, the you, want, you want to get the coordinates of where your the, your cattle are or your cow. Are. You send a text message. This guy is going to have a sim suit. Don't forget, he's going to have a sim suit inside. I, I showed it to you the last time you had a sim suit inside. Now, of course, just the way you and don't forget the sim is going to have a number and he's going to have his own phone number. All you need to do is to go on your own phone or any phone and send a text message to this particular sim. When the message gets here, this module is going to know. And once the message resides in it, because it has a memory to store the message, the moment the message gets to it, this JSM module, which is the submit on the will notify the mobile controller that the message is in my inbox. So what the mobile controller will then do is to now read the content of the message that's received. If the message is from maybe a network service, 
disguise message. It deletes the message and disguises it. Because it's not what it's looking for. But the message contains information that you have sent that has to do with get me the GPS location of where my cartridge are. But that one is once it reads it and it fits it. What it then does that it then now goes to the pin that is connected to the transmit line of the GPS module and download all the information that is in there. Once it receives it, it then begins to decipher it. Guess out the latitude, guess out the longitude, and every other information that concerns it. And then formats it in a mode or in a format that is presentable to you before it now sends it through the GSM module again via text message to you. Do you get it? So the GSM module is carrying out a two way communication thing. You send a message to it, then it sends a message to you. It sends a message to it, it sends a message to you. Also, when the cartoon has gone outside your geofence, like with the scopes, and it knows, because of course it's going to know that it keeps querying, where are you now? Where are you now? Where are you now? The moment it gets that information, and the result of that, where are you now, shows that they are outside the fence. What it does is it sends you a text message through this SIM module to let you know. I mean, just see this as your phone module. I would not call it phone module because it doesn't have all of the other features that a mobile phone carries or a land phone carries. But it's a SIM module because it can actually receive or house a SIM card. And when you can ask a SIM card, then it can do both call and SMS, including GP and OS, which you can connect to the internet through it. But we are not using GP and OS. We're not using the call service, we're only using the words, the SMS service. Do you understand? Does that make sense? So the SIM 800 l it has four pins too, just like the GPS we we'll give it power. But don't forget the GPS is going to go to 5 volts. Heat is going to be what? Between 3.4 to what? 4.3 volts. And then that's a transmit line on the internet. Does that make sense? And they are all connected to the mile controller. Don't forget, the GSM is connected to the mile controller, the GPS is connected to the mile controller. Can I continue? Yes. Okay. The The other thing here are the indicators. This is a mile controller. You have a resistor and then you have an indicator. You have under register and then you have an indicator. This is how the indicators are connected to the controller. Don't forget the indicators are just light emitting diodes. Maybe? And light emitting diode is going to have two pins. One is called the anode, the other is called the cathode. Hope oh, you are familiar with some of these terms. The cathode is connected to the negative of the supply. Why the anode is connected through a resistor to a pin on the mouth controller. Now, it has to go through a resistor so that the voltage that is being sent by this power controller does not just go directly and damage this light in the air. Light in the air would work fine with two volts. The mouth controller is going to be supplying five volts. So you don't want the five volts to get it. So you have a resistor. A 330 ohm resistor is fine for this purpose. A three now this light emitting diode can be of any color. Obviously, I believe you know that. So this could have been yellow, this could have been green, this could have been blue, this could have been white, this could have been red, any color. Just to have an indicator on board. The indicator is to let you know the system is on. I mean, how do I know most times that uh, my TV is on? Say when it's in sleep mode. I see indicator of home, so I know it's on. How do I know my stabilizer is on? When I don't even hear this, hear it make any sound, I see an indicator. So the essence of, it, of the indicator is to let you know when you are looking at a system from afar, you can tell you this system is on or is off. Does it make sense? Yes. So that's how the indicators are actually connected to the power control. Does it make sense? Huh? Mm -hmm. What is the essence of these uh, two indicators? Actually, I have two indicators there. One of them, I've mentioned that already, and one of them is purposely there to know that the system is on. If I don't see indicator, you apparently the system is off. For instance, the system is off right now. And that's why it's not on. You can't find an indicator on there. But once I can find an indicator on there, I know that ah, this system is on. What I use the second indicator to do is to know when the system is conversing with the GPS module. I design or 
program is them to make this light second indicator blink several times in a second every time the system is actually trying to assess the GPS move. So if I send the text message and receive the text message, and part of the message is go and get me GPS location. Once assessing the GPS module, this indicator is going to be flashing. So I know oh, it has gone to query the GPS module. That's how I know. It just is not it's not serving me any purpose other than it's like um, uh, me sending him to go and get me pure water. And I can actually I, I can actually see the pure water woman from this end. So I know he gets there, but he does not get it. Do, do you understand? Because don't forget. Uh, it's programming. There could be a glitch in the way, there could be an issue, there might be anything that the system is actually, that not making the system not actually carry out the action you want to carry. Mm -hmm. So the indicators are actually there, we put actions to the indicators at some different points in the code so that we can, oh, you do what I want you to do, or you do what I want you to do. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. uh, so that was the two indicators there. So one of them is primarily for indication, power indication. When you make the put power on the system, it comes on, so I know the system is on. But if it's off, then I know the system is off. Again, oh, well, let me give you another instance where the, the indicators come in handy. You just charge a battery, and you just implanted the battery into the system. A month or two months after you came back, and you saw the capsule, and there's no indicator on the body of the system, or the system. You already know the system is off. Do you understand? Okay. That way the indicator is the last thing here is the mouth controller. And I'm not going to bore you with that either. But I'm just trying to cook with it. The mouth controller that I decided to use, I'll use in the program, is the PIC 15F2620. Am I ready to it? Yeah. The mouth controller has 28 pins. It's a PIC 2620. It has 28 pins in total. 28 pins in total. Are you following? Mm -hmm. Now, but just like every electronic component, you need to give it voltage for it to actually be usable. In place of the mouth controller, the mouth controller requires more than just voltage pin. For it to work. There are five, there are six statutory pins. Let me write it. There are six statutory pins that must be connected for this one compared to the it's called statutory pins. Six of them. One of them, those pins, is the one that is called your VDD. This is the one that goes to the plus 5 volt of your supply. Are you following? There's another one called your VSS, and that's the one that goes to the negative of your supply. How many pins have we used now? We used, used two. Then there is another pin. Interestingly, this particular controller has two VSS. This one of has two VSs, so three pins are out. Then there's this other pin that's called the VPP pin. When I got it, the VPP is your programming well, voltage programming pin. It's called your voltage programming pin. And what it does, yes, what it does is you're supposed to actually through it goes through a 10 kilo resistor to your video. If you do not connect it this way, it's not going to work. The system, the IC is not going to work. It's like having two grand or it's like having two supply lines. Are you with me? So, how many pins have we used now? That's four. Then we have these other two pins. They are called the oxygenator pin. Oxygenator one and oxygenator two. Two starting capacitors. This is your four megahertz crystal. 
And these are 33 people for our capacitor. 33 people for our capacitors. Now, I said there are six to three pins that must be connected from the 828 pin before this IC can be of use. The first one is your VDD pin. It goes to the fibers of the supply. The next one is your VPP pin that goes through a 10 kilo ohms resistor to the fibers of the supply. I said there are two VSS that goes to the negative of the supply, so four pins are gone. Then there is the auxiliator pin. There are two oxidator pins, oxidator 1, oxidator 2. These two pins are connected to a crystal, please look up, sir. They are connected to a crystal oxidatory capacitor. And from the crystal oxidatory capacitor, they are connected to two ceramic capacitors before they are taken to ground. So you see the way they are connected. From the oxidator pin to one end of the crystal oxidatory capacitor, from the other oxidator to one end of the crystal oxidatory capacitor. You now have a capacitor, a semi capacitor across this, semi capacitor across this. The other end of the capacitors are not joined together and taken to a, to a negative level supply. Mm -hmm. These are the six transitory pins that first must be connected before this small controller can be of use. If you take out those six pins from the 20th pin, then let's do what? 22 input output pins. So if you are asked, how many pins is this power controller? You tell it's 20 pins. But how many input output pins do you have there? You have just 22. Oh, where did the other six pins go? They are static three pins. They are pins, they are like the set of pins. Uh -huh. You get my point now. Pins that are require certain conditions before the IC itself can actually move. It's like, it's like having a battery in your car. You understand having a battery, then having a steering or, or, or an accelerator. Like, uh, what do you like, what call that? Uh, clutch and the uh, tussle and stuff like that. Does it make sense? If outs outside this space, the other 22 pins are where connections are now made to the JSM module and to the GPS module. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. So if I, if I was to draw something, let me, let me try something. Oh, this is hot. So if I was to try this, if this was the GPS, the GPS model, I need only its transmit line. Do you get it? Mm -hmm. I connect to one pin on the controller. The pin that connects to the controller. If this was my GSM module, it has its own TXD and it has its own what? RSD. And so, let me put that in. TXD. So, its own TXD is going to go to an RSD. These are another RX. Then, its RX is going to go to what? TXD. Does so, it make sense now? So, you can call this own. RX1, RX2, hmm? then this one will be TX2. Then the indicators, two indicators. So, indicator one, are you there? Indicator two, does it make sense? Uh, Where is the way up there? That's Do you get it? So if you look at it, we have only used one, two, three, four, five pins from the old 22 pins. Mm -hmm. So and then, but the question that we are asking is, what happens to the remaining other pins? We didn't use it. Now, is there any other smaller microcontroller that we could have used 
Yes, they are. But the issue is this. Because of the volume of the program memory that this IC has, is why we used it. We didn't use it because of its number of input output. We used it because it has a program memory space, a large program memory space, compared to those smaller ones before it. Because the code was actually what was huge. You get, you get it now. Writing code into an IC is like somebody who has a storeroom and intends to actually put things there. It gets to a point where what you are putting there can no longer fit because you have exhausted every space available. What do you do? You go for a larger space so you can accommodate more things. Do you understand it? So that's why we showed this item. We didn't shoot it because of its number of input and output. We could have actually gone ahead and chosen an IC with just with just 18 input output pin. Mm -hmm. And from the 18 input output pin, if we remove the 6 or 5 statutory pin, we just have 13 input output pin. Mm -hmm. For the 13 input output pin, we we'll use 5. Mm -hmm. It's the remaining. For this one, the remaining other pins are not The GPS requires just one pin, the GSM requires two, the indicators two, two pins, and that's it. Mm -hmm. Do you understand it? That's the block. That's a book. But one very important question that you are not going to be asked, that I will answer you. Very important that we discuss it. And I want to let me clean. Let me smile. I'd like you to follow. The question is, how is the latitude and longitude? Because which that's like the most important information or piece of information that we need as your pro as the project is concerned. Mm -hmm. The most important aspect of the information we need is the latitude and the longitude. Uh, let me say latitude. Long, longitude, longitude. Okay. So, so you need these two information. Now, when when the GPS connects to the internet, I told you it receives quite a lot of information. Informations are huge. And when the informations are received. An example of a typical coordinate that you get is this. I'll send to you. Find something like this. 43 uh, uh, 9039 and then 105 12 5793. You get an information like this. Many times, the first two digits is always your. The ones with after the degree, I mean, the degree. The next two, I'm oh, sorry, the next one is always your minutes. So this is always the degree. This is always the minutes. The other ones are the seconds. When the information comes. So if you have this value that is, this is same as say. 40 degrees, 3 minutes, 9039 seconds. Of course, it can have not, it can have, it can have any of those connotations in it. But that not is where it's out. Are you getting my point? The same thing with uh, uh, the latitude. The latitude here is your 105 degrees, 12 minutes. Why? Oh, oh, there was an there was a zero there. There was another zero. There. It's four hundred. Uh, this one hundred fifty minutes, twelve minutes, 
I don't know that's one of five. Yeah, there is, there is a, uh, if there is a standard, uh, explain the standard. When the details are sent, there is always the well. If I write, please, what no design? If I write, I will. What what is the name of the sign? Apostle. Apostle. There's, after the degree, there's an apostrophe. That's in the garbage that the GPS module receives. The one at, where the garbage, I mean, is where the garbage, where the apostrophe ends, is where your degree, degree ends. The next two digits or two information you're going to get is actually going to be your meanings. Anyone that is left after them are the seconds. As I said. So when it comes, you find something like, 40 this x then one two three four like that so what you do is you you scan up until this guy to say this the next two is not always three the next two should be anything that is left is in the circles now let me let me make this beautiful now when this is received hmm, if you receive this via text message, this information is not so very useful to me. They are just coordinates. There are 40 degrees, 40 degrees, uh, 3 minutes, 9,039 seconds latitude, uh, 105 degrees, 12 minutes, 5,703 seconds. If you have this for latitude and you have this for longitude, if text message if, if you receive a testimony and this information is given to you, it's not useful to you. You just have coordinates. For this to be useful to you, you still have to go to your map and input this into the coordinate. Like, what location will give me 40 degrees, 39, uh, uh, 9 seconds, this, 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 and this, in reality than longitude, before you know where you are. The only way it can be useful to you is if this is sent to you as a link, a Google link. When I mean Google Link now, it has to come with something like HTTP with this information. Mm -hmm. So that when you click on it, this goes to the map, resolves, and then puts you directly or exactly where this location is. For this to actually go in as a link, it has to be converted from here to a decimal. So you can call all of these uh, degree coordinates, but it has to be converted back or converted to degree decimal information or details. If it is to go on Google, let me give you an idea of what, what you should expect. You should have something like this. HTTPS, are you there? Google.com forward slash maps forward slash question mark q equals you're not going to have latitude comma longitude https double slash google.com forward slash map forward slash question mark q equals your latitude comma uh, latitude comma longitude if you click on this link it will take you to the map and you go to the location exact location where that coordinates is on the map now but this information you have here cannot do this for you this is what the gps model will give to you it's not your responsibility to convert this to decimal to convert to decimal you are to divide the seconds by 360, convert the minutes by 60. The result of this and this should be added to this. Three six hundred. Sorry, that's sixty times sixty. 
Thank you. Can I continue? Mm. Let's do it. If this was the latitude information that was given to us, are you with me, sir? Yes. You have to divide the seconds by 60 and 60, which is 3,600. You should have an answer. You have to divide the minutes by 60, you should have an answer. Have the result together and add it to this degree. That is you converting this degree to decimal. So please, if you have your calculator, let's do that. 9039 by 3600. What did that do? Nine thousand and thirty-nine divided by three thousand six hundred. Two point five one zero eight three three three. Two point five one zero eight three three. Five one zero. How about this? Three divided by sixty. What did they give? Was I not going to do Zero point zero five. Are you? Now, so forty plus two point five one. That gives what? Forty two point five one. Are you? Yes. Plus zero point zero five. That gives forty two point five six. Is that not it? Yes. That becomes your latitude. Forty two point five six. Can I continue? How about for the longitude? 5,793 divided by 3,600 would give what? 573 divided by 1.609. How about 12 divided by 60? 0 0.2. 0 0.2. So let's do it. 105, are you there? Yes. Plus 1.609 will give 106.609 plus what? 0 0.2 will give 106.809. So my longitude will be 106.89. Does it make sense? Yes. So if this was what was sent to you, If this was what was sent to you, it would be your responsibility are you here, to, convert to convert this to decimal. That decimal information it will be done for both your latitude and your longitude. Is what you are going to do what? Put here and here and send. Or that the system eventually sends to you. That is on this link that you now click on that cannot tell you exactly where on the map the location of those cartoons or the assets you are trying to track is. Do you get it? Yes. So, you just don't make use of the raw information that is given to you. Of course, don't forget, like I said, this of course is going to come either in north or west. This can come in south or east. Do you get it? Yes. You're going to have all that information in front of you. But those informations are not useful to you. You want to get an alert or a text message notification. Pam, you want to click on it. And you want it to do what? Take you somewhere on the map. Mm. If that's what is going to happen, which means when this is received, after this is received, mm. what happens internally, which of course you don't see, yeah, this is then converted from all of these cells, from the degree to the world, to the decimal. Those decimals are what are now sent in this location and sent to you. Do you understand it? Mm. So, this, this is very pretty straightforward and simple. Mm. So, this. Happen. But don't forget, it's always latitude before what? Longitude. Latitude before longitude. Does it make sense? Does it make sense? Can I clean the board? One other last thing. One other thing before I close, close this. Last week, I did 30. I've done 30. Now, one other question is why so it's likely to ask you is how is the job on 
Then from that coordinate, you want to set a distance from that coordinate to a distance of your shoulders. But this is what happened. There are two ways you can go about setting boundaries. You can log on to Google Map. And let, let's assume that your set if a, a, a virtual boundary. I can actually be at my house right now and go on the map and type of step engineering just type this address. Are you with me? And say on the map it points me that direction or that location I've requested from. So I will put a pin there. Then I can ask myself how far would I want to create a boundary from this end, from this point on the map? Say I want a boundary to the filling station. You know, that's very simple. I know the filling station. All I need to do is to type that Google filling station on the panel. Then it's going to show me on the map. What I'll do is I'll draw, let's add that to me, and just drop on that pin there. On the map. Then I can now draw a line from this end to this end. The map will automatically tell you the distance from here to here. It's an application. I can do it on the phone. I don't know. If, I don't know. I've not tried it before. I've tried it on, tried it on the laptop before. Mm -hmm. But I believe you should work on the phone. Just look for a location. Put a pin there. Type on that. Pick up another location and put a pin there. If you draw a line from the first pin to the next pin, it's going to tell you the distance. Mm -hmm. You see it written on it underneath it. The distance from that place to that place. Mm -hmm. Say it said the distance is 90 meters. If you shoot 90 meters as your virtual boundary. What it therefore means is this, what it means is this. If this was the head, and this was you here, what you are saying is 90, 90 uh, uh, meters to the north, south, east, or west is the boundary you have created. So if, if the person did not, even go, did not even go to the filling station, but began to go this way, the moment it crosses 90 meters from this location, this way, the system is going to let you know the person is outside the boundary, isn't it? If the person did not go backward, I mean, not going towards the top, the person is going towards Oshodi. And the person does not go towards this side and say, ah, don't mind those people. The virtual boundary they created is to the filling station. I'm not going to go to the filling station. I'll go to Oshodi instead. And face is here. 19 minutes outside this, uh, uh, this direction is going to know too. Person, oh, no. I don't want to go here, I want to go towards what is the name of this place we are go? Oku Jobi or Edi Oro and it moves here. Do you get it now? So the 90 meters that you have created is 90 meters anywhere in any direction but from where? From the set location. So that is one way of setting your boundary. The other way of setting the boundary, which of course is the way we have designed the system to do, is this. You can query the system at any point in time and say, what is the location of where you are right now? Where are you right now? Once the system tells you its location, you can now tell it store that location as your starting point. Which is what we designed in your system to do. That's how it's been programmed to do. Because the truth is, what if you are moving, you move the camera, so you move the cattle from one location to another location. So your new location becomes your starting point. And then to anywhere they want to wander to around that particular uh, uh, around the boundary. Do you, do you understand what I just said now? So what you do, or what I want to show you now is how the location is being calculated to know if the location has what has been exceeded on the bridge. It's lookable. It's very simple too. 
I thought we were doing something very, very simple. And so I got to shake it. It's a bit, a bit simple. What simply happened is this. Before distance can be calculated, two longitude and latitude locations must be known. Which means you must have latitude one, you must have its details, you must have longitude one, you must have the details, then you must have latitude two, you must have the details, you must have longitude two, you must have the details. Do you understand me? Do you understand what I just did? Now? Now, but the details you need are not just going to be the degree, minute, and second. The details you need are going to be what? The degree decimal. Now, I said the way you get the degree decimal is to divide the seconds by 3600, divide the minutes by 60, add the result of those two actions together, and put it on the word, on the degree. That becomes your degree decimal. After you have gotten that degree decimal, you are supposed to divide that degree decimal by 180 and then divide it by pi. This is what I mean. That way you are converting it to what you call radian decimal. Now, radian, you, divide, you are converting it to radian. To divide to radian, you need to divide your latitude hmm, to get the radian. Let's call it. As you can also make it of this example you use. No. Yes. Oh, you have the numbers. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You have the numbers. You wrote it down. Yes. Please give me for the latitude. The first one, latitude was 42.56. So this is going to be 42.56 yes. divided by 180 divided, oh, divided by, you know 180 by pi or pi over 180? 180 over pi. 180 over pi. And 180 over pi is the same thing as saying 180 divided by 22 all over 7. Are you? Yes. That's going to be 180 times 7 all over what? 22. This is what you now divide this by. If you divide the result of this by this, you are going to get what? An answer in what? In radian. The answer result of this should be around 57 point something. Please do it. 180 times 7 divided by 22 should be 57 point something. 57 or 56? 57.27. 57.27. So if you divide. 42.56 by 57.27. Whatever answer you get will be in radian. Please look up now. You are going to do that for your latitude. You are going to have a value in radian for latitude. A value in radian for longitude. Do you know what is latitude 2 and longitude 2 are? This first one is your starting location. This one is any location they, you, they had that you have chosen to read from. Why are we still talking about the boundary you want to create? No, you must have created the boundary. Okay, okay. Don't forget that the boundary is just a distance in meters mm -hmm. from your first, your starting location. Mm -hmm. So if this was my starting location, please, I want you to follow it now. Mm -hmm. If this was my starting location, don't forget this starting location has a latitude and longitude. Mm -hmm. A latitude and longitude that is in degree, minute, and second. That we must have converted to what? Degree decimal. Are you following me? Can I continue? That degree decimal will then be further converted to radian decimal. To convert to radian decimal, just divide it by what? 57.27. 57.27, add it to 57.7, 180 divided by pi. 180 divided by pi will be 180 divided by 22 divided by 7. Which should be 180 times 7 divided by 22. Isn't it? That will give us our latitude in radian, our longitude in radian. 
for our starting location, which was here. Let's assume, and I've said I don't want the cattle to go five meters from this starting location. Let's say some minutes after, they must have gotten here. If I pick the latitude and longitude of this location, now it's going to be different from that place, which is the new light and that's the latitude two and longitude two. That one too, don't forget that one too, will be sent or will be received in degree, minute, and second. Not east, south, or west. What are we supposed to do? We are supposed to convert back to what? Decimal. How do we convert back to decimal? We divide seconds by what? 3600, minute by 60. The result is added together to our degree to get it in decimal. That decimal degree is then converted to radian. To convert it to radian, we divide it by what? 57. 0.27. That value, those two values are what you are now going to now put into this calculus, into this formula. <laughs> Please look up. What you are doing, you are now converting these two into distance. The results will tell you if they have gone outside your boundary. That formula is this. Our course, that's the inverse of the cosine, right? Into sine latitude one multiply by sine latitude two, then added to cos latitude one. Multiply by cos latitude two, then multiply by the cosine of longitude two minus longitude one, all multiply by six three seven one. Six three seven one. I thought you were sick. Now use sixty three point seven one. So that is in meters. Come on. Are you alright? You mean parking? Is that a truth? Three minutes ago. Mister Man, sir, you know the what latitude we are putting here? Abby? Is the radial latitude for our starting point? How about this? The radial latitude for where for the new location? Okay. 